You know, I have to say what I find really fascinating about you is that you actually study this stuff. You study how um, misinformation spreads during disasters. And so it made me really curious about what you are seeing when it comes to COVID-19 and of course with the protests. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing, I think might be surprising for a lot of people that are just kind of experiencing maybe this for the first time. Um, but it's not so surprising for those of us that have looked at social media use during crisis events in the past, um, because we do see this sort of coming together, people trying to figure things out, they try to make sense of things, and, and sometimes they get it wrong. Um, certainly what we're seeing in this event, due to the long-term uncertainty and all the, the fact that the event just keeps going and going and going with COVID-19, is that there's just more opportunity for people to to get things wrong and to spread misinformation and now even disinformation has started to spread at a higher and higher level. So certainly though, though what we're seeing is not unexpected from a researcher's point of view, it's a lot more volume and a lot more sort of what I would call internet toxicities are kind of manifesting in our information spaces right now. And I noticed that you used words that people may not be as familiar with, misinformation, disinformation. What's the difference? It's a really important question, and, it, and um, it's so important for how we think about um, how we address some of these problems as well. So misinformation is information that's false, but not necessarily intentionally false. So a rumor about what might be going on that might turn out not to be true, but the person who, who initially told it didn't, didn't know that it wasn't true. Um, whereas disinformation is information that's false or sometimes just misleading that's that's produced or spread for uh, an objective, often a political objective. And so it's intentional misinformation. So considering that you've been studying this for some time and now you have the lens based on what's going on right now, you talked about COVID-19. What about misinformation and disinformation when it comes to the social unrest? Oh, certainly. Um, we're seeing similar kinds of things. Um, it's hard. I think we want to be really careful to be able to distinguish between you know, legitimate criticism of social inequities, police violence against African Americans, and understand that these are le <clears throat> legitimate expressions of that are happening and they're manifesting as, pro as protests. At the same time, there are entities who are trying to exploit some of those protests and exploit some of that anger bo on, on both sides, both the, the protesters and the counter protesters to, um, to, for political gain. And so we can see the intentional pushing of certain narratives and shaping narratives to um, for, for folks that may not align with, with even the groups that they're trying to sort of spread their narratives within, but they may tr be trying to shape those movements towards some other set of political objectives. And some of those are foreign, um, but a lot of those are actually domestic political actors trying to, to use these to gain, to gain power. Yeah, that's such great insight. Thank you for um, shedding light on those differences. Um, speaking of that, is there a difference in how misinformation is spread during, let's say, natural disasters versus man-made crises? I would say yes. We've been studying a combination of, of different kinds of events. We've looked at um, earthquakes and hurricanes, and we've also looked at acts of terrorism, protests, events, and even now sort of election um, election crisis that we might be able to describe. And certainly I think with, with the man-made events where there's a, a human cause, um, there can be a lot more um, attempts to inject disinformation into the system to kind of point the finger at one group or another or to use the event for some kind of political gain. Um, but that's not, it, it, it's not that it doesn't happen at all with some of the, the natural disasters, including um, including hurricanes, especially where we see disinformation about climate science be in, in interjected into those conversations as well to try to shape the narratives of what's going on. So it's not unheard of to have disinformation in, in, in a crisis situation that's not man-made, but it's more common in the man-made crisis event. And certainly misinformation is common in both because people just sometimes get things wrong when they're trying to figure out what's happening in a crisis event when there's so much uncertainty. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And how would you describe the scale of the problem right now? It's so hard because the way we look at things right now is through social media and social media is so distorted uh, in terms of the kinds of conversations that are happening there, both in, maybe in our behaviors, but also there's intentional distortion going on there. There's all sorts of information operations, people trying to make things trend. And, and so it's hard to say like 
if we went out in the street and interviewed people, how, how big is the problem compared to if you look at social media? It looks huge. It looks like it feels a, huge. It feels it does. huge. It feels it's like, good. oh my gosh. I mean, yes. Yeah. I hope that you can tell me that that's not a reflection of, of who we are right now. I, I don't think it's an accurate reflection of who we are right now. And I think that's an important thing to keep reminding ourselves. And even ourselves as individuals, when we go into these spaces, we're not our regular selves in these spaces. We're someone slightly different. We're, there's more outrage, there's more anger, there's more snarkiness. Um, and so I think it is good to remember that if we had you know, some of these same conversations in person, which we can't really do right now, but if we could, they would look a lot different than they, than they manifest online. So though I'm not really uplifted by, um, by the things that we're studying, I do think that what we see online is, is worse than what we are as a society. Yeah, I was going to ask you, why do you think that is? Why aren't we necessarily our best selves online? And you think it's the in-person factor. I think that has something to do with it. I think there's some, some theories, there's some contestation, but we know going back into like some early studies in the 1970s that people would act, and it was all email and it was mostly scientists, and that some of them would have behaviors in the way they would talk to each other that wouldn't happen in, in person. Um, and so I think we can extend some of those and keep looking at, at, at our behaviors and certainly um, the way we interact online is, is, not, um, is not the same as the way we interact in person. And that's part of the problem, but that's not the whole, that's not the whole problem, but that is definitely, it it's definitely feeds into this. Yeah. Yes. Big part of it. Well, look, are there ways we can avoid misinformation or do we just need to get better at spotting it? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to spot misinformation, and especially disinformation. We've, we've spent you know, 40 hours looking at one account to see if it was a real person or not and, and couldn't figure out at the end of the day. And that's research. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You spent 40 hours? 40 hours. Oh, yeah. I, can, I, I can't say the name of the person because it might, it might be a real person, but I uh, asked other researchers. We looked at their content, their history over time. We met, and still, with all of our tools, it was hard, hard to tell. So in some cases, it's really hard to tell um, you know, when someone's trying to manipulate the conversation. I think mm -hmm. the most important thing we can do is, is tap in to, first of all, how information is making us feel. Um, because we have this idea that misinformation is going to distort, you know, that we can use our brains to get around it. But really misinformation, disinformation, excuse me, manipulates us at the sort of like this emotional, intuitive level, this gut level. And so tap into like, when you're when something's making you really angry, think about now why does that information make me angry, and why might someone sending that information want me to be angry? And that at the end of the day might be actually yeah, we should be angry. We should be out in the streets doing something about, it and then absolutely go for it. But if you step back and you're kind of not sure, you know maybe just slow down a little bit. Don't share that. Wait a little bit. Wait till the conversation goes on. Um, and just be a little bit more careful about what we sh what we share, and really more careful about who we let into our circles online, mm. because that's actually how sort of legitimate activism has been infiltrated by disinformation campaigns and other kinds of things where we think somebody is part of our group, we let them in, and then they end up kind of trying to distort us towards something that's not our goal. So just kind of be a little bit more careful, take responsibility, and this number one thing, if you get something wrong, it's okay to say, hey, I got this wrong. Don't delete it and hide it and take it off. Because 100 people already saw it and three people reshared it. Go tell those people who reshared it, hey, I got this wrong. You might want not want to reshare it. You might want to delete yours as well. And then tell people. So make sure that, we, that we're correcting ourselves and then even learning how to kind of empath with empathy correct others so we can just sort of um, collectively help clean up these information spaces. Wow. I love what you shared um, on so many levels. I mean, number one, the piece of, I, I love that you as a researcher, you know, you often focus on your data and the things that are tangible and you're saying, well, tap into your intuition a little bit. There is a feeling part of this. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, uh, I, I've shared misinformation during a crisis event, right? Like I, I, it, it's, um, I think all of us are vulnerable. This is another thing to remember. It's like, it's not like you've done something horrible. Like this is something that happens. And if we can like, we can learn from those mistakes. We have to acknowledge those mistakes and learn from those mistakes and sort of develop better habits about how we interact. So I'm much less likely to share something now um, as I was a few years ago when I, when I was still just kind of going quickly and looking at the, at the data and trying to help and, and sometimes getting things wrong. And just, you know, just slow down a little bit, be more reflective, be a little bit more savvy about what might be going on in these information spaces. Don't engage, but just kind of engage in a thoughtful way. 
I tell you, such great advice. Um, you know, misinformation, disinformation, to your point, it's been around a long time, but obviously feels overwhelming right now. And now that we know it's here, we've gotten some great tools for how to deal with it. Um, so great, I understand there's something called collective sense making. So what, what does that mean? So there's this idea, and, it, and it's not necessarily just related to social media. There's this idea that when a crisis event happens, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of uncertainty. We don't know what's happened. We don't know exactly how it's going to affect us. And under those conditions, we as humans want to come together with other people, gather information and try to make sense of it all. Mm -hmm. And we call that collective sense making. And increasingly we see that in online spaces where people use social media platforms to come together and try to come up with explanations for what's going on. And sometimes those explanations can turn out to be true. And sometimes those explanations can turn out to be false. So it's this very natural process. It serves like psychological benefits, informational benefits, and yet it does make us vulnerable to spreading misinformation during times of crisis. Oh, which is a good reason to maybe just slow down. But obviously knowing that this term is out there, just knowing it and identifying it will certainly help us try to avoid the, the pitfalls of it too. Um, one more question. What are the social, let me start that over. What are social media sites doing to try to stop misinformation and disinformation? This is an interesting question. I think, um, you know, four years ago, social me media sites weren't doing very much. Um, they uh, were just recognizing that they had sort of a problem. They, they were kind of downplaying it. And, um, and then they were just trying to figure out the infrastructure for what they might do to address it. More and more, we are seeing them take action and develop policies, develop procedures around certain kinds of misinformation. And certainly with COVID-19, we saw them actually put in some policies and start um, taking off content, labeling content, directing users to um, sort of more authoritative content when they saw something that might be untrue. And so we do, did see a bunch of different policies. They're evolving very quickly. Um, certainly the policies they have for, for COVID-19 and, and sort of health misinformation have been different than political disinformation where they've been a little bit less likely to make, um, to take action. Although in the last few weeks, we've even seen um, updated policies and actions being taken by both Twitter and Facebook and many of the other platforms have actually uh, even moved more quickly in, in terms of some of their policies as well. So we, I think that's a good thing. Um, and yet a lot of these policies aren't yet up to the task of, mm. uh, you know, of all the toxicities that are happening on their platforms. And a lot of times putting them in place often goes a little too slow and the information is already spread pretty quickly before it's corrected. Are some sites doing better than others? Um, yes, but it's like a, it's one of these races where one gets ahead and then the other pulls ahead and then the other pulls ahead. Um, and certainly um, a lot of us might see that, that if we look at the broad view, they're way behind, they're all way behind, but um, I, I have seen some, some positive, um, positive steps by both Facebook, Twitter. Um, early on, Pinterest was leading the way in some of their policies. They're, I'm not sure they're doing as well as they used to. TikTok certainly trying to address some of these things um, in different ways. Uh, you know, we could go through the long, long list and a, and a lot of places are um, trying to address things. YouTube has made some progress, but we can still see a lot of progress that needs to be made. Um, so each of, the, each of the platforms is very different. Uh, we just put out a blog post with the initiative that I'm working on called the Election Integrity Project that goes through all the election related policies from the different platforms. Happy to point that out and send over a link if you're interested. It's a lot to sort through. <laughs> so that would be it helpful. Is. <laughs> so much. Right. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine what the average person goes through trying to figure through. Even as a researcher, this is too big of a space to get my head around it. Um, okay. So what can we do to stop the spread of misinformation? I think one of the things we can do is just as individuals take more responsibility for, for our role in the system. I think, you know, we can think, oh, I'm just one little person. What difference do I make? Well, that's the same way we can think about voting and that would have us not vote. But at the end of the day, it really does make a difference, especially if it's not just me, but if it's everybody else like me who's doing these same kinds of things. So if we can take more responsibility about trying, you know, to go slower, to not share misinformation and also to correct ourselves and even correct um, others when we see misinformation spreading in these online spaces. I think we can help. We're not going to solve the problem with that, but we can help, you know, make, you know, solve a little part of the problem and make things a little bit better and help slow the spread of misinformation on these platforms. Perfect. Um, okay. And you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how should we talk to our family and friends about misinformation when we do see them sharing it? How do we have that conversation? 
Yeah, there's a couple of different approaches. If it's someone that's close to you, I do think, you know, privately is the right way to have that conversation one on one, um, not mediated through a computer if possible, uh, you know, maybe Zoom, but, but certainly not a text based one. Really have a conversation with them, talk about why um, it's problematic and try to open up. What I try to do is open up a, an exchange where someone can just, you know, oh, wait a minute, I'm curious. Is, is this is this link misinformation so they can begin to to share with a question between us privately before they go share it more publicly um but again uh just with empathy i mean i guess the, the best advice i can give is if we're going to correct people do it with empathy do it in a in a personal way if it's someone you don't know well in an online space correcting can actually help the online space by doing it a little publicly so you, by writing in a place where, so if someone shares a false Facebook post, if you post a comment, then the people who saw that post might be able to see the comment. But again, do it with empathy. Don't say, oh, that person's wrong or bad or something else. Just say, hey, you know what? I can understand why you think this, but it turns out that that's not true. And here's a link to the source where it is true. But I think the most important thing is to realize we all make mistakes. And if we are gonna correct, which I recommend, um, we are gonna correct folks who shared misinformation, do it with empathy. Well said. Um, but what should we do if we inadvertently share something that ends up being misinformation? Yeah, I think it's really it's really high time that we got uh, that we develop a set of practices, um, a best practices around what we should do. And the most important for, thing for me, and it's different in each platform, is to acknowledge in a place where people who have seen your your post can see the correction. So acknowledge, update, uh, edit that Facebook page to say, hey, this turned out not to be true. Put it on the top of the page because people won't see it if it's, if it's, you know, if it's way down in your post. Um, add comments to say this, is, this turns out to be true. If it's on another platform like Twitter where it's going viral and it's still spreading, people are retweeting it, you might wanna delete it, but then come back and, and write another tweet that says, hey, this, you know, this turned out not to be true. And, and I wanna let people know that I, that I deleted it. So try to, to be open about the mistake. Don't just delete and hide it. Try to make sure the people that saw your misinformation also see your correction. And so that they can, they can correct if they spread it too. Um, and sort of the way misinformation cascades, we want the corrections to cascade as well. Yeah, it's just so hard because it's embarrassing, right? When you feel like you're duped and you share something that's not true. So that's yeah. hard. Yeah, and it's totally hard, but I, I think we know this from journalism and we know this from some other research as well, is that actually when you correct yourself, people, you gain credibility. Now, if someone wants to exploit, say, hey, you made that mistake, you know, and, and try, tries to tear you down, they can use that incident. But generally, when people correct themselves, we actually see them with, with higher credibility later um, because we, we know that they're going to acknowledge their mistakes, whereas others hide their mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, just like, you know, the journalism outlets that correct themselves are much more trustworthy than the ones that don't. Uh, and so, and everyone makes mistakes. And so I think it's really, um, as we're making the decision, oh, I shared that misinformation. Do I really want to correct? We forget that, like, actually it looks good to your, your audience or your followers when you correct. I had to correct something last week. I got three compliments from my followers. Really, thank you for correcting that. That's really helpful. And I really appreciate how you did it. And so just... Just own just it. Be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that way you're not being part of the problem by just deleting it. You wanna be able to, to your point, just stop the cascading. So that makes sense. Well, I feel much better because, um, I mean, being real, I feel much better because, I mean, it's only happened to me a, a couple times, but still, it's if, if you can have a hard time spotting, then I feel like the rest of us, yes, we're human. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I got one of those letters uh, three and a half years ago from Twitter that said I was following or had retweeted a, a Russian internet research agency oh. uh, disinformation account, right? So, I mean, we all, <laughs> we are all out, out there and we all make mistakes. And, and even for someone who, I wasn't yet researching disinformation when I had followed that account, but, um, but uh, you know, I was an internet researcher and in theory, I should have known better, but none of us did. And Jack at Twitter, Jack Dorsey, who runs Twitter, had retweeted one of the internet research agency accounts. So um, we're all susceptible to this stuff.